Okay, hi guys, what we are going to do today, we are going to read a little bit more of our book and we're going to look at understanding language choices, language choices that this um, author has been using. So let's have a little bit of a recap once again on what we've read. We know about Michael, his mum and dad and his poorly baby sister. Um, we know that Michael's not very happy at the moment, especially with the move that he's done. He was very, um, very interested in going inside the garage and now he has done. Um, and we were able to visualize that yesterday by drawing those pictures. Also, I saw some amazing pictures, um, a really good one with just the torch um, shining in and the different things around him. I felt like I was holding that torch. Brilliant picture. Um, so what we're gonna do, let's go into chapter four now and find out what's gonna happen next. I hardly slept that night. Every time I did, drop off. I saw him coming out of the garage and coming through the wilderness to the house. I saw him in the bedroom. I saw him come right to the bed. He stood there all dusty and white with the dead blue bottles all over him. What do you want? He whispered. I said, what do you want? I told myself I was stupid. I'd never seen him at all. That had all been part of a dream as well. I lay there in the dark. I heard dad snoring and when I listened hard, I could hear the baby breathing. Her breathing was cracked and hissy. In the middle of the night, when it was pitch black, I dropped off again, but she started bawling. I heard mum getting up to feed her. I heard mum's voice cooing and comforting. Then there was just silence again and dad snoring again. I listened hard for the baby again and I couldn't hear her. It was already getting light when I got up and tiptoed into a room. A cot was beside their bed. They were lying fast asleep with their arms round each other. I looked down at the baby. I slipped my hand under her covers and touched her. I could feel her heart beating fast. I could feel the thin rattle of her breath and her chest rising and falling. I felt how hot it was in there, how soft her bones were, how tiny she was. There was a dribble of spit and milk on her neck. I wondered if she was going to die. They'd been scared about that in the hospital. Before they let her come home, she'd been in a glass case with tubes and wires sticking in her, and we'd stood around her, I stood around staring in like she was in a fish tank. I took my hand away and tucked the covers around her again. Her face was dead white and her hair was dead black. They told me I had to keep praying for her, but I didn't know what to pray. Hurry up and get strong if you're going to, I whispered. Mum half woke up and saw me there. What do you want, love? She whispered. She stretched her hand out of the bed towards me. Nothing, I whispered and tiptoed back to my room. I looked down into the wilderness. There was a blackbird singing away on the garage roof. I thought of him lying beneath the tea chests with the cobwebs in his hair. What was he doing there? So this is chapter four, okay? All we're going to do very quickly is just look at a couple of phrases that the author has used. OK, let's have a look. It's this bit. His face was dead white. Her face was dead white and her hair was dead black. What I want you to do is think about those two phrases and why you think the author has used those phrases. Pause the video now. OK. There might be loads of different reasons um, for the author to use those kind of phrases there. It might just be to build that tension up or, or to make you feel that there's something really bad and something really wrong with the baby. OK. Oh, and yeah, with the baby itself. But let's have a look a little bit more. This bit says, I took my hand away and tucked the covers around her again. Her face was dead white and her hair was dead black. And if we look back in the book, there's a part where it says, Dead blue bottles were scattered on his hair and shoulders. I shone the torch on his white face and his black suit. OK, so once again, the author has used those words, white, black, dead white, dead black. Maybe he's making some links across the book to make us feel a connection with those characters. Let's read chapter five. I asked them at breakfast what was going to happen to the garage now. When are they coming to clear it out? I, I said. Mum clicked her tongue and sighed and looked up at the ceiling. When we can get somebody to come, said Dad. It's not important, son. 
Not now. OK, I said. He was going to be off work today so he could get on with the house. Mum was taking the baby for more checkups at the hospital. Should I stay off so I can help? I said. Yes, he said. You can take Ernie's toilet out and scrub the floorboards round it. I'll go to school, I said. And I shoved my packed lunch into my sack and headed out. Before we moved, they asked me if I wanted to move school as well, but I didn't. I wanted to stay at Kenny Street High with Leaky and Coot. I didn't mind that I'd have to get the bus through town. That morning, I told myself that it gave me time to think about what was going on. I tried to think about it, but I couldn't think. I watched the people getting on and off. I looked at them reading their papers or picking their nails or looking dreamily out of the windows. I thought how you could never tell just by looking at them what they were thinking or what was happening in their lives. Even when you got daft people or drunk people on buses, people that went on stupid and shouted rubbish or tried to tell you all about themselves, you could never really tell about them either. I wanted to stand up and say, there's a man in our garage and my sister is ill and it's the first day I've travelled from the new house to the old school. But I didn't. I just went on looking at all their faces and swinging back and forward when the bus swung round the corners. I knew if somebody looked at me, they'd know nothing about me either. It was strange being at school again. Loads had happened to me, but school stayed just the same. Rasputin still asked us to lift up our hearts and voices and sing out loud in assembly. The Yeti yelled at us to keep to the left in the corridors. Monkey Mitford went red in the face and stamped his feet when we didn't know our fractions. Miss Clarts got tears in her eyes when she told us the story of Icarus, how his wings had melted when he flew too close to the sun, and how he had dropped like a stone past his father, Daedalus, into the sea. At lunchtime, Leaky and Coot argued for ages about whether a shot had gone over the line. I couldn't be bothered with it all. I went to the fence at the edge of the field and stared over the town towards where I live now. While I was standing there, Mrs Dando, one of the auxiliaries, came over to me. She'd known my parents for years. You OK, Michael? She said. Fine. And the baby? Fine too. Not footballing today? I shook my head. Tell your parents I was asking, she said. She took a fruit gum out of her pocket and held it out to me. A fruit gum. It was what she gave the new kids when they were sad or something. Just for you, she whispered, and she winked. No, I said. No thanks. And I ran back and did a brilliant sliding tackle on Coot. All day I wondered about telling somebody what I'd seen. But I told nobody. I said to myself it'd just been a dream. It must have been. Okay, so Michael is thinking a lot at the moment. He's thinking about all those different things in uh, what is happening to him, all those changes in his life, and but he's not telling anybody about them. Let's have a little look at part of the text that we just saw then. I thought how you can never tell just by looking at them what they were thinking or what was happening in their lives. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever just looked around at people and thought, Hmm, I wonder what they're thinking. Hmm. He also says, I knew if somebody looked at me, they'd know nothing about me either. Okay, there are times in our lives when definitely we've got all things going on, okay, and we don't show those things to everybody. But it's being aware, I would say, whether or not somebody is feeling the way they're feeling. And I think talking to them is probably the only way that you'd be able to tell. And whether or not that person wants to talk back. Let's look again at Michael, okay, and those personality characteristics and what we know about him at the moment and more because we know more now because we've read five chapters of the book. Friends, he's got some friends. Who are his friends? Leaky and Coot, good, and they love playing football, okay, and Michael thinks about Leaky and Coot quite often. He's actually said he misses them, I think. he Well, he doesn't say he misses them, but while he's sat in the garden, he, he's just thinking about them being or playing football up on the field. I'm sure Michael would have liked to have been uh, playing with them too all day. We also know a little bit more about his school. Um, see, can you remember the name of the school? You might need to go back into this video to have a look. Okay, that was Kenny Street High. Okay, Kenny Street High School. 
Also, we know quite a lot of his teachers now as well. And Michael has given different names to those teachers as well. I wonder if I've got a name that people might call me. I hope not. Maybe I'll have to try and find out, find that out. We also know a bit more about his family. OK, we know about how he is feeling towards his sister. Does he like his sister? I think he does. I think he's worried about her more than anything. His personality. What more do we know about his personality? And finally, those feelings. But are Michael's feelings obvious? Is he like showing everybody his feelings or is he hiding them from people? Hmm. What I want you to do for the first task is to either go back to your picture that you've drawn of Michael already and add a few more things around the outside or do another one and just add some of these things now that what you can think, what you know more about Michael after we've read those five chapters. Pause the video now. OK, for the second task, what I would like you to do is this. Imagine that Michael has a secret journal that he writes in each night before he goes to sleep. Write two diary entries. I want the first entry about when waking up and hearing his sister cry and the second entry about his day at school. When we come back to school, all of us, I'm, we're going to do this diary entry a little bit more often because we want to explore his, his feelings a lot as we're going through this book. So this won't be the first lot of diary entries that you do. We will be doing more of them to put yourself in his position. Remember to use these things. I want to see some emotive language. That's describing that feeling, how he is feeling. You don't have to say, I felt sad. You could say, tears welled in my eyes as I drifted off to sleep. That tells me he's sad. Use a fronted adverbial. We know those fronted adverbials. You can always go back to our work that we've done previously into the folders to check and use a relative clause and use one of those relative pronouns, maybe who, which, when, that. OK. Here's my example that I've written for you. I don't mind if you want to um, magpie a couple of ideas, but don't write the whole thing out. So I put 26th of February 2021. I've used today's date only because um, it said in the book that it was coming up to spring and it's the same with us. So I've used February as the month. Sleeping has been really difficult lately, especially with all the crying at night. Last night I heard mum feeding her and then it went quiet. I slid out of bed without making a sound and went to check on her. Her breathing, that has been so bad lately, was raspy and it sounded like it hurt. I felt her chest to calm her down. I woke mum too. I didn't mean it. She wasn't angry this time. When I got back into bed, all my thoughts turned to webs and dust and him. OK, this is your turn. I look forward to reading your diary entries today.